Putin is continuing uh, to advance uh, into Korea. When did we beat Japan at anything? To disperse with 30 bullets within half a second. 30 magazine clip in half a second. Right now, if you Google the word idiot, a picture of Donald Trump comes up. I just did that. We'll do it live! Fuck it! Hello and welcome back to the Political Circus Weekly Podcast. I am your host, Mike Ursery, and this is episode number 33. Were you keeping up with the news this past week? Because we had quite a bit going on. It seems that tensions are getting even higher between the United States and Iran. And now we're wondering if the tensions are going to turn into an all-out war. We'll talk about that, and we'll talk about how it appears that John Bolton might have an itch that he's wanting to scratch. Also this week, President Trump had his birthday, and people tried to ruin it by trying to make June 14th, trying to get people to call it John McCain Day. Oh, and people were also posting fake images of Donald Trump's birth certificate. This, of course, was a joke that people were making because back when Barack Obama was president, Donald Trump made a huge deal about how how Obama may not have actually been born in the United States, but born in Kenya. I'm sure everyone I'm sure everyone remembers all of that. But before I get into those things, first, before we take a look back at this week, let's really quickly take a look ahead because the debate field for the first Democratic presidential debates have been announced on June 26th and on June 27th on NBC. We will have Debates on both nights between 20 candidates, 10 one night and 10 the next night. I saw this on Friday afternoon, and I saw it because it was tweeted by Tulsi Gabbard. Gabbard, who is one of the presidential candidates, she had she had announced that she had qualified for the debates. And Wednesday, June 26th, she will... Uh, participate in the debate that night. So from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern, Wednesday night, June 26th, you will have Gabbard, Cory Booker, Julian Castro, John Delaney, Bill de Blasio, Jay Inslee, Amy Klobuchar, Robert Francis O'Rourke, because I refuse to call him Beto, Tim Ryan, and Elizabeth Warren. And then the following night, June 27th, you will have Bernie Sanders, Michael Bennett, Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, Kirsten Gillibrand, Kamala Harris, John Hickenlooper, Eric Swalwell. How did he qualify for the debate? Eric's, he's polling at like 0%. How did he get on there? And then I was thinking that if you have Biden on one stage, that means Biden gets about 10 to 15 minutes to answer questions, and then every other candidate gets the standard two minutes, but now you have Biden and Sanders, the two front runners in this primary so far that could change later on. It usually does. So how much time are Biden and Sanders going to get to answer questions and how many questions are these two men going to get compared to number of questions and the time to respond for these other candidates? I personally am looking forward to these debates. One reason why is because I love this stuff. Yes, every four years, I love watching presidential debates. I love following the candidates. I love learning about the candidates. I just like politics. I do. I, I like As much as this stuff drives me nuts, I also love it. It's a double-edged sword, and I'm kind of a glutton for punishment when it comes to keeping up with politics and keeping up with the stuff people say and the ideas that people come up with. But another reason that I'm looking forward to this is because 
I'm looking forward to all of these candidates tearing each other apart. And yes, they are going to do that because they are all like they all want to be the nominee, obviously. But they all are going to expose stuff about each other. And they're going to do this because that's the same exact thing Donald Trump is going to do when they began presidential debates leading up to the general election in 2020. Yes, somebody is going to come out of this debate, or I'm not out of this debate, I'm sorry, out of this primary, out of this primary season. Somebody's going to come out of this as the winner, and they are going to come out wounded. And then they have to deal with Donald Trump. Donald Trump, who is going to bully, patronize, belittle, provoke, and all the things that Donald Trump does, you're, all the things that he does, I have a feeling you're going to see these candidates do the same thing to each other. Now, that's not to say that every single one of them are going to, but you're going to see some of them do it. And I'll make an early bold prediction here, and that is that so far, the position at the top is not going to change. I think you're still going to see Biden in front with Sanders in second place. But some of these candidates who are either at or near the bottom, who are pulling around between 1% and 3%, you will see a couple of them climb up a little bit higher, climb a little bit higher in the, in the polls and the standings, whatever you want to call it. But then you're also going to see a lot of people at the bottom stay at the bottom. And the ones who I think are going to stay at the bottom are Eric Swalwell. Obviously, he's going to say something that's just going to make no sense at all. I think Kirsten Gillibrand is going to stay towards the bottom. I think Amy Klobuchar is going to stay towards the bottom. And some people may not like hearing this, but yes, I think Andrew Yang is not going anywhere. Sorry. Andrew Yang is the businessman who is not a politician, who has a plan to give $1,000 per month to every American. I, First of all, I don't think he's going to get much time to speak, and I don't think he's really going to get an opportunity to explain that idea to people. And I just don't think he's going to really do that much in this primary. My other prediction is that no one is going to drop out after this first primary. No one is going to start dropping out until... I'm going to say after the Iowa caucus in February is when people will start dropping out. But that's June 26th and June 27, 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern on NBC on both nights. So buckle up, strap in, get ready because the fun is about to kick off. Since we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about John McCain Day, also known as Donald Trump's birthday, also known as Flag Day. Yes, so first and foremost, June 14th is Flag Day. June 14th also happens to be Donald Trump's birthday, and this year Donald Trump turned 73. But on Twitter, the hashtag John McCain Day was trending, and this is something that was started by Andy Lassner. Andy Lassner is an executive producer for the Ellen DeGeneres show, and he tweeted out something. It was... 4.57 a.m.? Who gets up at that time? Anyway, 4.57 a.m. is what this tweet says. And Andy Lassner, well, first of all, why is he up before 5? And why is he up and thinking about Donald Trump before 5, especially on his birthday? That's so weird. Anyway, he tweets this out. Honoring an American hero today. Let's celebrate Donald Trump's birthday today by having hashtag John McCain Day trend. I'm sure this would mean a lot to a patriot like Donald Trump, hashtag John McCain Day. And then sometime afterwards, it went viral. More people started tweeting it out. And then sometime that afternoon, I looked at Twitter and one of the trending topics was hashtag John McCain Day. Of course, I'm pretty sure the whole reason for that is because, well, because of the feud between McCain and Trump when McCain was still alive. And then there was when McCain died and Donald Trump was not invited to his funeral. Um, But aside from that, also going on on Trump's birthday, people were posting these 
fake birth certificates online, and they were made to look like Donald Trump's birth certificate. I saw a few that showed it to be a showed it to be a birth certificate from Kenya, and then I saw one that said the Hospital of Jamaica. And of course, this is a dig at Trump for being a quote unquote birther by alleging that Barack Obama should have never been president in the first place because he was not a natural born citizen. He was instead born in Kenya. Of course, he never showed actual proof of that. He was the one making the claim, but he never showed the proof. And so now we have this going on on Donald Trump's 73rd birthday. I didn't see this last year or the year before. So I don't know if this is going to be a thing now or if it's just something that someone came up with this time around. You know, regardless of how people feel about the man, and yes, I understand there are a lot of people who don't like him for a lot of different reasons, but to go that far to ruin someone's birthday is just incredibly petty. It is really, really petty. And Waking up before 5 a.m. and thinking of this is not only is that petty, but that's also really strange. For one thing, if I wake up before 5 a.m., I'm rolling over and going back to sleep and I'm not getting up until my alarm goes off, which is 6 a.m. So if I get up at 4.57 a.m. and I look at the clock, I'm going to be upset because I only have another hour to sleep. And another thing, too, if... You find out it's the president's birthday, and your first thought is, let's ruin his birthday by dedicating this day to someone that he did not like. If that really is your first, or even if you think of that at all, get help. Okay, get help. Because that's not normal. It's also incredibly childish, and it just makes you look like a douchebag. It makes you look like a douchebag. So... I'm kind of surprised. I am kind of surprised I'm seeing you're talking about that right now. I don't know why I have to put that on the show, but it happened this week and it kind of is worth talking about because you never, you don't really ever see that. Of course, then again, during the Trump era, we've seen a lot of things that we probably thought we never would see. Well, one thing that we might see soon is something that we definitely do not want to see. And the thing that we don't want to see is another war. You probably saw in the news this week that two oil tankers were attacked in the Gulf of Oman. One of them belonged to Japan, and one of them belonged to Norway. And this happened near Iran, and now Iran is being accused of orchestrating this attack. And what's really significant here is that one of those tankers was Japanese, and the prime minister of Japan made an official visit to Iran that same day. And if Iran actually did attack Japan's tanker while the Japanese prime minister was in the country, that is a bold move. That is a very bold move. Tensions between the U.S. and Iran have been building for quite some time. Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of the Iran nuclear agreement, the United States, reimposed sanctions on Iran that were lifted ahead of the Iran nuclear agreement. And now this. And the thing here is that we heard some different versions of the story before we finally know what we know up to this point. One of the early reports I saw was from Sky News, and Sky News had said that both tankers belong to the United States, uh, which turned out to be wrong. Another thing I saw was that the tankers were hit with torpedoes, and then it went from torpedoes to limpet mines. And then another thing, after, after limpet mines, the person who owned the Japanese tanker said that they saw a flying projectile strike the ship. So you have media pushing out all kinds of wrong information. You have United States Central Command who said that both tankers were hit with limpet mines. And then you have someone aboard one of the ships who said that he saw something fly through the air and hit his tanker. 
another thing that the owner of this tanker had said that the the strike on his tanker was above the waterline. So there's all kinds of stuff out there right now. And I hate to say it, but even though the U S has put out one version of the story, I, with other versions of the story out there, especially from an eyewitness, it's hard to say exactly what happened. And I'm not just going to buy the United States version just like that. Another thing about this is that while the U.S. is making claims that Iran was behind this attack, they're not showing proof. Now, I did kind of see a a video, which the the quality of the video was not very good. The video was really grainy. And watching it, I couldn't really, like, I didn't know what I was looking at, to be honest with you. This is a video from U.S. Central Command. And I was looking at it, and I'm just thinking, what's going on here? But... Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on Thursday, June 13th, one thing that he had said was that the weapons used and the level of expertise behind the attacks suggest that Tehran is the culprit. Okay, can you provide some evidence to go along with that claim? Can you show that, in fact, it was Tehran who attacked a Norwegian tanker and a Japanese tanker while the Prime Minister of Japan was in Tehran. Donald Trump told Fox News Channel, according to NBC News, that the incident had Iran written all over it. Okay, President of the United States, leader of the free world, if you're going to accuse another country of doing something, show the evidence that backs up your claim. Secretary of State, who is tasked with foreign relations, If you were going to accuse a foreign country of doing something such as striking tankers with innocent civilians on board, if you're going to make that claim, can you show the evidence that backs up that claim? And can you show better evidence than a grainy video that doesn't really show much? And along with not having proof, they're really not... They're also not really saying much about what Iran's motive would be here. Japan's prime minister was in Tehran this week to talk with Iranian leadership. According to CNN, Shinzo Abe, I think is how you say his name. If I'm saying that wrong, I apologize. According to CNN, he was in Iran to try to mediate over the nuclear deal, the one that Donald Trump took the U.S. out of the nuclear drill, nuclear deal that Barack Obama and his administration had made with Iran. So if Japan and Iran are having talks, why would Iran attack one of Japan's tankers with Japanese people on board? That doesn't make any sense. What would Iran's motive be in that situation? And why would they attack an ally of the United States knowing that tensions between Iran and the United States are so high right now? And what would Iran even stand to gain by doing that, knowing what's at stake, knowing who's going to be provoked, knowing what the United States can do? What is Iran's MO doing that? But then again, let's assume that Iran actually did do all of that. Reasons really aren't important. Let's just say that Iran did actually do this, and the ran- Iran is actually trying the hand of the United States. How does the United States respond? And would this lead to a war? And would this lead to the United States invading Iran and removing Iran's clerical leadership? That would not be a good thing, in my opinion. First of all, I don't know what the U.S. stands to gain by doing that, but not only that, the U.S. is still in Afghanistan. The U.S. has been in Afghanistan since 2001. And this coming September will be the 18th year, officially be the 18th year 
that the United States has been been in Afghanistan. To this point, what has the United States accomplished in Afghanistan? In 2003, the United States invaded Iraq. They removed Saddam Hussein and his regime. And then it created a power vacuum. And what we thought was going to be something fairly quick, removing Saddam Hussein and then being done, and then installing a new democratic government in Iraq, turned into a quagmire with thousands of American lives lost, tens of thousands of the lives of Iraqi civilians lost. And what did we actually accomplish in Iraq? Because if you recall, years later, we sent troops back to Iraq again to fight ISIS. So do we really want to cause the same thing in Iran, being that we're still in Afghanistan? I think we still have – I don't know what role troops are playing in Iraq, but I believe we still do have troops in Iraq. You're going to have that same thing in Iran. Do we really need that right now? No, we do not. Are American lives worth losing over Iran? No, they are not. In my opinion, they're not worth losing over anything unless our freedoms or our borders are directly threatened by Iran or any other country. No, American lives are not worth losing. I don't care if they attack oil tankers that don't belong to the United States. I don't care if John Bolton has an itch to invade Iran and he wants to scratch it. I don't care if Mike Pompeo is saying, yes, Iran did this without showing evidence. American lives are not worth losing. Honestly, I don't know why Trump has John Bolton in his White House. I do not understand why he has John Bolton as his national security advisor. Donald Trump ran on a non-intervention policy when he campaigned in 2016. He ran as a non-interventionist. And now he has an interventionist in his White House. It doesn't make any sense. I've seen a few theories floating around. One of them is that Donald Trump wants to secure his reelection. And he would be willing to put the country in another war in order to secure that reelection. I don't think that's actually the case. I've also seen that Saudi Arabia, who also has heightened tensions with Iran. They usually do. Saudi Arabia and the United States are allies. Trump loves Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is actually the ones who want war with Iran. I don't know if that's the case. And I've seen the same thing about Israel, that Israel wants the leadership in Iran gone, and they would try to provoke a war against Iran. I don't know if any of these are actually the case. These are just theories going around, but we don't need another war. We, we've been at war since 2001, nonstop, and we just don't need another war. I lost people I know in Iraq, friends. I lost people I know in Afghanistan, friends. I also have friends who came back from Afghanistan, missing limbs, missing legs, missing arms. And when you look at the current state of these countries right now and our involvement and what we thought we were going to accomplish, but we actually didn't, the only question I can ask is, why did we even do it in the first place? When you sit and you think about all the wounded combat veterans we have in this country, all the things they struggle with physically and psychologically, When you think about Gold Star families, when you think about mothers who lost their kids, when you think about spouses who are now alone, when you think about people who lost their siblings, what are we even doing? What is the United States even doing? We don't need war with Iran. It's not worth it. And it's not going to accomplish anything. I hope Donald Trump does the right thing here. I hope the U.S. does the right thing. And they choose not to go to war with Iran. And I really hope that the actual story comes out on this. And I hope it doesn't lead to war. I will be back with another episode. 
next week. A new episode of the Political Circus Weekly podcast premieres every Saturday on the Think Liberty Network. You can find me again next week. Everyone enjoy your weekend and enjoy a good upcoming week. And thing sucks!